Well, it's this week's media wrap up, and as previously mentioned, we're giving you the name of one of the people that made a comment about it. But Matt said that it was too undemocratic for me to choose the name that had no likes to it, even though. I really wanted this one to win, so we have to put it into a straw poll amongst some other contestants that were much more popular, but please, for the love of God, do your old pal Uncle Friendly Geordies a favour and call this segment Jar Rules Funtime Spooktacular Feet Friendly Geordies. How did that not get one like? I should have liked it. Please, in the straw poll, Tom Glassy's Jar Rules Funtime Spooktacular Feet Friendly Geordies for the win. Now on to checking up on this day and age's Edward R. Murrow, the chick that looks like salacious bee crumb in a wig on the project. What did she have to say about the Australia Day debate? Ooh, I wonder what. And as always, as was mentioned in last year's video, the only reason why I'm talking about the Australia Day debate is the only reason why I talk about the same-sex marriage plebiscite, it's the only reason that I talk about pill testing, it's to talk about what the strategy is of the mainstream media in trying to get people to focus on narrow issues and why they do it. So let's watch and see what their in-depth analysis is on this pressing issue. Today, an unexpected voice joined calls to change the date. This is an opinion piece from Jeff Kennett last year. Who cares what Jeff Kennett thinks? He was a Premier of Victoria in the 80s. I forgot who he was. It's my job to cover politics. I thought they were interviewing a leather couch. If we're going to develop a harmonious society, if we're going to address the issues affecting the Indigenous community, we need to respect their views of that date. First of all, they have found the one Liberal who they agree with to put Liberals in a positive light. Classic project. Second off, it is the Liberal Party that has defunded Indigenous programs in this country by half a billion dollars and they're sitting there going, Respect the wishes of the Indigenous population. Those people want their funds reinstated that your party can't. I think it's possible to give just that little amount to allow other people to be happier. Anybody that disagrees with the traditions of Australia and the Australia Day date should go back to where they came from. Oh, wow. The woman that said, oh, wow, to that random dude's opinion was the same one who was laughing at the biggest ecological catastrophe in living memory. And she's sitting there on her moral high horse going, I cannot believe this guy who has no political influence whatsoever doesn't have the same opinion as me. I mean, an old person not wanting to change the date? Well, I'm shook. But what I think Jeff Kennett's message is about is... If you're sitting at home and you are absolutely dead set, no, we shouldn't change it, don't you think his message is maybe you could just listen to the other side and change... You don't even have to change your mind yet, but just listen and think to yourself, maybe I haven't seen it from their point of view. The one thing I will say about Australia as a culture in general, how insecure are we? This would not happen on an American talk show panel. Everyone would be yelling over the top of each other going, Sir, that is absurd. That is absurd. No, I can't let that single point go past. This, every single time you ever see an Australia discussion panel is a bunch of people with those confused facial expressions just waiting for their turn to end and clearly rubbing their hands like a little rat that uh, I really want the camera off me now, but I still want the paycheck. There's very few arguments I've heard from the people who don't want to change a date that kind of is any way sympathetic and really taking in the other side of the debate. Yeah, but who in this debate is sympathetic of the other side? They're not, because they're extremely emotive people that have no understanding of the broader issues facing this country. And so they sit there and get extremely emotional over these issues. And that is why the project stokes this debate every single year. Marketing research has shown that if they can get peaks of emotion in people and attach their brand to that name. It doesn't matter if the emotion is good or bad, just the only thing you don't want to have is just an ad that comes on and goes, toothpaste now with three different colors in it. I don't know if that actually helps your teeth or not, but ooh, it looks like a lolly now. No one cares, right? But if you can put out a toothpaste ad that just has like some droning thing in the background and then like some kid that's about to get beaten by his mean dad again, and then at the last moment he goes and sprays toothpaste in his eye, he goes, my eyes, and then he runs out, and then it just goes like, toothpaste, we're for freedom. In that moment, it piques people's emotions, and then, as a result of your brand being attached to that emotional peak, 
people buy into it. This is why all the major banks do all these things of being like, we're so trans rights, we're really pro gay marriage. They do these things because it doesn't actually affect their bottom line. In fact, the Business Council of Australia wanted gay marriage passed, which is the reason that it was turned into a plebiscite as opposed to just this quick little pass that the Labor Party wanted. They wanted it to be drawn out for eight months because they knew that it would run people's emotions high and then they could attach their brand name to it. This is the same thing that happens with change the date or pill testing. All these things are safe to talk about and it makes the company seem good. The same companies that just go in basically, the CEO just walks around and just machine guns a bunch of orangutans but sits there and goes like, oh, we're for men not being mean. You're a pretty mean man. You kill orangutans. And as I said last year, numerous times, if the date changes, cool. I don't have a single issue with that. What I have an issue with is these people who laugh at ecological catastrophes and purposefully mislead the public into focusing on minor issues, and even worse than that, say that the Liberal Party is fixing these huge ecological catastrophes. I have an issue with them turning around and going, oh my God, I cannot believe you're so unenlightened, unlike me. This absolute corporate suck cock who lives in the middle of Melbourne, drinks champagne all day, clearly doesn't think about anything that I'm doing. I just get a teleprompter in front of me. But you, you the audience, be better. We have Barry Weiss, who's an editor at the New York Times. So, you know, her view on things is going to be great. And she was on the Joe Rogan podcast. And look, I obviously don't expect Joe Rogan to know anything about Australia. And his opinions, you know, whatever. He's like just an interviewer that sits there and is just like, but Barry, Barry, have you tried DMT? That's fine. But she is pretending that she is an expert on Australia relations. Joe Rogan has a huge reach. Let's listen to what her views are. They are my views on Australia when I was five. One of the things that was so interesting about Australia is that in certain ways it's a more... You know, it's thought of as sort of a macho culture, maybe more masculine, a little bit more conservative than here generally. And yet the left has won there. Look at the issues that she's talking about afterwards as well. And you tell me that they're left issues. The Singaporean government has most of these issues. The last thing I think about the guy that was prime minister for 50 years there is him just sitting in a Woodstock concert being like, where's Hendrix? So many of the major issues that we're fighting, we're killing each other over now. They're very good Universal people. health care. Yeah. Mandatory 401k, nine, it's like an $18 minimum wage, pensions, four weeks of vacation a year. Like, I think they get maternity leave as well. Oh, long yeah, maternity leave. yeah. It's just um, like so many of the things that here are up for grabs, they already solved. Now, really pay attention. This is why they think we have all these benefits. You are basically listening to your auntie and uncle that don't really pay attention to the news, just sitting around eating lamingtons going like, uh, yeah, I think it's because, you know, we're nice people. They have a small population. Small and homogenous. Yes, and it's an enormous place. You're dealing with a place as large as the contiguous United States of America, but there's only 20 million people. Oh, I'm aware. They think the reason we have Medicare and 401k, otherwise known as superannuation, and maternity leave, and good minimum wages, is because we're a small population. Every last one of the things that they mentioned are union victories. The reason we have them and the US doesn't is because their unions is basically just a couple of wharfies in Boston going, hey, you wanna play some cards, Tony? They don't have unions anymore. They have these weak little skeletons of what a union was, and that's the way that our unions are going, which is, by the way, why you need to sign up. Even if you don't get any benefit from it, which most people do, you get about $100 a week more if you're on a collectivized union contract than you do as just going into your boss's office and being like, uh, I think I'm worth $17 an hour. Oh, I think that can be arranged nuclear scientist. There's that element to it, but the reason that you need to join your union is because it is a democratic responsibility of yours, because unions essentially act as lobbyists for you. Just like how all these corporations have huge lobbyists working for them in Canberra, if you don't have union representatives saying, we need a raise in minimum wage, no one says it. And then all the lobbyists just sit there and be like, uh, compete with Zimbabwe? What's their minimum wage there? Uh, it's about a trillion Zimbabwean dollars. Yeah, yeah, but Australian dollars. Uh, 30 cents. Yeah, let's put it down to 30 cents. That's what happens. When you start eroding unions, you start eroding your political power. America would have exactly the same benefits we had if they had strong unions. They were like, it's crowded in that restaurant. And I was Mate. like, you mean I don't have to wait for an hour to get in? Like, <laughs> That's her third point. That like, 
getting an iPhone is a bit quicker here. Therefore, we're more relaxed. And so our politicians just went, yeah, 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 Medicare for all. <laughs> the Liberal Party fought against Labor for 40 years about not introducing Medicare. I mean, it's the same thing with superannuation. Superannuation was opposed by the Liberal Party. And the reason is, is because corporate interests didn't want to have to pay into their workers' salary for their retirement. All of these accomplishments are a direct result of the Labor Party, but the reason the Labor Party is a decent party is because we still have somewhat strong unions. And this generation, because only 5% of them are signing up, that will be eroded and you'll start having these American conversations here where it's just like, uh, yeah, I mean, like, it'd be nice to have that, but what'd be even nicer is if we legalize brownies, man. They have it so good that they're a little complacent and that makes me uh. concerned because China. Okay, right. That's like okay. the big story yeah. there. China's the big story here. This is why she thinks she's an expert. She came here and she had dinner with some friends. That's what a New York article is. She clearly conned the New York Times into taking a vacation here and then wrote this tiny little fluff piece of just going, yes, yeah, so I was just talking to some friends there and they seemed, you know, a little bit relaxed. That's cool, isn't it? You shouldn't be working for the New York Times. You should be working for Getaway. They're enormously dependent on China economically mm -hmm. and they love having that money. Uh, but they seem to be a little bit like sleepwalking through history and not it's at least some people that I, I spoke to. You barely talk to anyone of significance. You talk to apparently one person from a think tank and the rest of the time you spent at the Ivy. When it comes to China, the liberal government has just followed exactly what the Americans want. That is not a wise policy, especially because the global economic power structure is shifting. China, whether you like it or not, is going to be, think about this, just 10 years from now, they are likely to be worth double the GDP of the US. And yet the US is sitting there just going, you have to be basically a client state of the US. And, and, and to put you in check, we've got a couple of boats floating around you a country that is twice as economically rich. That'll contain you, couple of dinkers. It is going back to the old hegemony days before there was the industrial revolution. And look, I didn't wish that that was happening, but it is. And the liberal government have just been completely ignoring that. And then every time that the Americans say like, oh yeah, you just need to put up a boat there to show China who's boss. Hey, isn't that the Philippines? The global economic power is shifting. China is going to be the head of Asia. Now, you would think that if you were Australia, you would be doing everything you possibly can to engage them about how to write up the rules of this new world order. The Liberal government have been sitting there following exactly what the Americans say, which is like, yeah, we'll set up some naval bases here. Yeah, we'll provoke them into combat into the South China Sea. And then the Liberal government, because they aren't leaders, they are just a bunch of corporate consultants that are used to taking orders from other people and then pretending that like they're in charge. They sit there and they just go, well, you know, you helped us out in World War II, and I don't think we've repaid that enough yet. But the rational approach would be to sit down with China and all the other Asian countries and say, this is the path forward for how this new world order should be looking. So we have a say in how those rules are written because the rules are gonna be written with or without us. So she's kind of right in that she's saying that we're sleepwalking through history, but she's saying that we need to be more combative to China. Ridiculous. Here's a good idea. Just like how we banned Gavin McInnes for being a dangerous American influence, we ban you. Your ideas are terrible. See, it just got me all riled up. And now I can't get into the thing that I wanted to do this video about, which is the fact that BuzzFeed's news article site has been pretty much decimated. But more news as it comes next week. And that just makes it all the sweeter that we get to savor that. Mm. Revenge is a dish that is best served cold. But in all seriousness, Staff at BuzzFeed, please know that from the bottom of my heart, I really mean this when I say, eat dog shit. And remember, each like represents your like for when Joe Rogan goes, huh. That's the other reason I listen to the podcast is to hear that and to hear the mic move closer and go, no fucking way. Please share and comment below. Come in.